Good morning. You're with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting here this morning to uh, generally to uh, talk about how the pension systems in Vermont are governed um, and to hear some thoughts from some folks who've spent a great deal of time uh, looking at best practices and thinking about um, how pension systems should be governed. Um, before we dive into uh, to some uh, witness testimony here, though, I think it's really helpful for us to um, to just acknowledge that there's there was a lot of information uh, misinformation that we heard in the public hearings that we've held um, over this past week. Um, a lot of folks don't understand who makes the decisions on how our pension systems operate and, uh, and how the investment decisions are made. And, um, and so I, I think it's worthwhile reiterating that the reason we're having this conversation about governance is because um, the legislature doesn't have a direct role in, uh, in governing the pension system in the state. And I believe rightly so. Um, I don't think you want political decision makers to, uh, to be making um, investment decisions on behalf of public employees in Vermont. Um, but the, the disconnect that I was uncomfortable with was, uh, was the implication that somehow, uh, you know, political decision makers screwed up and that's why we're, uh, that's why we're having conversations about governance. Um, and uh, so just to sort of set the table here for, uh, for this conversation about pension governance, um, we are gonna spend some time understanding how other states' pension systems are run um, so that we might consider uh, borrowing some best practices and, um, and making some changes here in Vermont. So I understand that there have been a lot of uh, what we'll call cafeteria table conversations. If we were present in the state house and there was a complicated issue that a lot of people had really intense feelings and thoughts and expertise on, we would, uh, we would gather in the cafeteria and we would share ideas and, and, uh, and, and come up with a suggestion. And so I think what we have right now is, um, is the result of a cafeteria table conversation. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna ask Tom Galanka, who is the chair of uh, our pension investment committee um, uh, to share, share what you've been up to for the last couple of days. Thanks, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks committee. I mean, you're probably getting sick of hearing from me over the past couple of weeks, but I, I think you're making a tremendous effort here, and I want to applaud you for, for everything you've done um, in trying to bring this issue to light. Um, I want to start by saying really, you know, in terms of governance, because today's conversation really is on governance, and, and the guiding principles really of my sort of testimony really falls into four categories. And I think I've looked at it through that lens, and, and one of which is, I think, to, to improve the system, and actually we're looking at the current system and how to improve it, there's really four things I think this committee needs to look at and to, to look at any proposal that comes to the table. Um, one is a, is a process of independence um, that VPIC is allowed to pursue from the treasurer's office, because I think that will help us as we've expanded in size and scope from $2 billion up to five, and if you add more money into it, up to $6 billion, that there is a need to, to have a more independent and more structured uh, approach to VPIC. Second thing is to maintain the equity on representation. I think that's vitally important for this to consider. The third is accountability. I know there's a lot of been questions in regards to accountability, both to the public as well as to the legislature. I think VPIC needs to be held accountable um, and in terms of investment performance, and, and I would welcome that in any new proposal. And then the final thing I think of my four comments is continuity and, and maintain the progress that we've, uh, we've uh, currently uh, seen over the past four years and continue it into any new system. So over the past week or so, we have been looking at the proposal and it, it goes a long way into that. We've, we've heard many different views. We've submitted some ideas for change that I think could be uh, enacted and looked at. Um, I haven't shared those yet today because we just kind of finalized some agreed ideas. I think there's like 17 items that we've kind of put together. Um, I wanted this committee to have a chance to look at that, and I would recommend that we, we have a process to sort of 
um, review each of those and we can give you our input into why we thought those were good prospects and why we, we, we didn't and sort of answer any question on those. But I didn't want to bombard you with those 17 sort of ideas that we thought about until we had this conversation today. Today, I thought it would be a good day. Uh, and we set this meeting up before our meetings of the past couple of days. So it's kind of overlapping some of these governance conversations. But I wanted to bring to the table two individuals that are have a tremendous amount of knowledge um, in pension fund management, particularly uh, national expertise and best practice. And uh, to that end, we brought in the CIO of the Vermont uh, in, uh, Committee uh, and the State of Vermont Investment Committee, and also Jim Voitko. And, and last year, we did a nationwide search for a replacement for our uh, uh, investment consultant, moving away from New England, New England pension consultants. And we had probably about 18 um, companies, uh, world-class organizations submit proposals. And RVK standed, stood above the rest in regards to what we needed here in Vermont. So I brought uh, Jim in uh, particularly here today because I think he brings a real good perspective and can answer a lot of questions of how other states do it and what does he consider as best practice and, and answer sort of on the fly questions of you know, how, you know, things we should consider or what specifically what the legislature should mandate that they get to have that that level of accountability and transparency that that you guys can feel comfortable with going forward that we're we are performing up to par. And uh, if there are areas of, of need and, and we can address them, you do it in a more timely manner than every five years from an experience study. So with that, I'll open it up to questions to the committee for me, but or I can turn it over to Eric or Jim, whoever wants to start and maybe make some, introduce themselves and uh, and go from there, if that works. Committee, do you have any questions for Tom? All right, nobody's diving in. Thank you for the introduction. Um, who, who would you like to call on first, Tom, since you- Why don't we, why don't we call on Eric? Because uh, we brought Eric in, I think it's been two and a half years now or three years now going on. Um, and he's really helped transform the investment staff to be one more of a professional staff that interacts in a more interactive way with our investment consultant. So Eric, uh, let's introduce you. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Eric Henry. I'm Chief Investment Officer. I've uh, been in my role just about two and a half years now, as Tom mentioned. I bring to that role 25 years of institutional investment management experience. And on my arrival here in Vermont, uh, in meeting my small team, one of the first tasks we undertook was underwriting every product in the portfolio at a very detailed level. It's essential that we as fiduciaries on this fund understand each product in the portfolio its role in the overall strategy of funding the pension fund liabilities, its risk return trade-off characteristics, and its overall value proposition. Are we getting value for the level of fees we're paying to the, for, for each of those products? That process identified several that we believed were just too complicated, too expensive, or too opaque for us to really be able to oversee them in an effective manner. So we sought to terminate them. Uh, again, at the end of the day, it's essential that we understand each of these products, how we expect them to perform in different economic scenarios, and importantly, when we're going to like them and when we're not going to like them, because there will be times when we have good products that play an important role in the portfolio that just tend to be out of favor. Uh, that process resulted in us terminating our entire hedge fund program. Uh, again, just too expensive, too complicated, wasn't delivering value. That decision alone saved us $80 million by avoiding a loss in the Allianz structured global product, products that essentially melted down last spring and avoided further exposure to losses uh, more recently in hedge funds like Melvin Capital and Archigos, which you may be reading about in the press. We terminated a number of active public sector managers whose secret sauce we simply didn't understand. Uh, those mandates were indexed in, 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 in until, if and until we can find a better strategy where we think, where we're convinced the manager can add value. Uh, but in that process, we saved upwards of 100 basis points in annual management fees on these products and importantly, eliminated strategies from the portfolio that simply weren't meeting expectations. Throughout this process, our team was really able to take ownership of the investment process. And, and this was new, getting my small team involved in the actual and identifying investment opportunities analyzing those opportunities, doing due diligence on those opportunities with the investment consultant and taking recommendations to the committee. Uh, but as a result of that process and this, this underwriting of everything in the portfolio, if and when there's a problem now, the staff will own it. 
it's simply not fair to expect a committee whose role is to govern and set policy to own every single manager hiccup or manager problem along the way. Uh, instead, uh, our team of uh, small team in conjunction with the consultant does the detailed on the ground due diligence and keeps track of these managers so that when there is a problem, we can respond effectively and quickly. The consultant serves as an advisor to the committee and as an extension of staff, but it's important to note that it's not the consultant's portfolio. Uh, one of the things that we've been successful in doing is being very judicious and clear about what strategies we want to pursue, what level of risk we want in the portfolio and how we decide to oversee them. Through that process, we've made great strides in professionalizing our small team by getting them involved in the process, by having them formulate recommendations, by having them present to the committee on, on complex and complicated issues. Uh, and further, we believe that having a higher level of autonomy for the committee will allow us to continue to professionalize our staff and enhance our ability to attract and retain talent for the long term here in the state of Vermont. Uh, my team members, Andy Cook and Katie Green, are top performers, and I commend my predecessor for hiring them. Uh, we could not find two better people to serve in the roles that they're serving in. And as VPIC and grows, as, v, as the VPIC portfolio grows, we envision a world where their, their, perform, their responsibilities grow uh, and their professionalism grows alongside those VPIC assets. This assures prudent oversight of the BPIC pension assets, not only for the members and beneficiaries of the pension plans as required by our fiduciary duty, but also at best cost and reasonable sustainable cost to the taxpayers of Vermont. I'm happy to take any questions, uh, but I, I know that Jim Boytko has a lot of uh, valuable information that I think will be helpful to the committee as well. Again, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. It's an important topic and I applaud your efforts in, in taking it on. Thank you, Eric, for being here today. Um, committee members, any question about what you have just heard uh, from the CIO? John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Eric, thank you um, very much for testifying this morning. Um, you know, I read the Wall Street Journal every morning, so I'm very familiar with or Chigos, but you just may want to explain it to, to, the, to the committee members and what it is and what has recently happened to it. Sure, so our, our Chigos uh, was involved in gaining some uh, very complicated and opaque positions in some companies. And with those, with those complicated, the concentrated exposures, those little problems tend to mag magnify themselves throughout the portfolio. Uh, similarly, with Melvin Capital, uh, they were in, they were caught up in the, the the short squeeze on Game Stock and other pennies, you know, other companies that really did not have weren't there was consensus was their futures were not bright. Yet these Reddit forums uh, conspired to bid up the prices of these companies and squeeze the folks that were holding those shares short. Uh, many of those funds tried to hold on. And many of them got caught up in. I mean, that this brings back to uh, back to life. The the, the uh, I think it was uh, either Keynes or Galbraith said, uh, you know, the, the markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. And that's one of the things we keep in mind in designing the portfolio. We stay away from leverage. One of the product, the, the Allianz Global Alpha product, that when we looked at it, uh, you know, the, the 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 marketing materials on it described it as fully liquid a fixed income substitute, you know, it, it, it sounded like a very safe product. Yet when we looked at the holdings, the actual exposure in the portfolio was four times uh, the dollars we had invested. To me, that implies leverage, even though the folks, uh, on, you know, the, the advisors were insisting up and down, no, no, that's not leverage. We believed it was leverage. We terminated the product. In the end, it certainly behaved as if it was leverage four times uh, when markets uh, dislocated in March. And, and Eric, just uh, or Chigos is a hedge fund or, or claimed to be a hedge fund. Correct. And, and Mr. Huang, who I think is the CEO of our Chigos, was also involved in Tiger Asia, um, which was another hedge fund, um, which pled guilty to criminal fraud charges. Is that correct? I think so. We've I've not dug deeply into our Chigo, so I've, I've followed it more at a headline level, and, and I'm thankful that we didn't have exposure to any of those products through the fund of funds that we had previously been invested in. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Mark Higley. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Eric and, and uh, Tom and everyone. Um, so there was an article, it seems like, you know, everybody's an expert, um, but there was an article in Vermont Digger, uh, I believe on the 24th, from a public pensions and capital market expert, criticizing VPIC and of course the treasurer for um, risky and high fee Wall Street investment strategies. Um, any, any response to that? And, and again, it was a, it was a lengthy article. Uh, I don't understand all the ins and outs of investments, but uh, uh, again, any validity to that? Is, is that uh, uh, something that's taken out of context? What, what, do, what do you have to say on that? So I would say two things. Uh, number one, the work that we did upon my arrival and uh, streamlining and simplifying the portfolio eliminated what I believe were any overly risky or overly expensive portfolios. Uh, we believe everything in the portfolio now warrants a role there. Uh, we recognize that you don't make returns without taking some level of risk. The key to managing an institutional portfolio is to balance that level of risk. Our, our goal is essentially to maximize returns within the portfolio at acceptable levels of risk and liquidity. One of the areas where we do pay higher fees is in private markets. Uh, we do so in order to seek to uh, achieve an illiquidity premium, and we've had success in doing so. If you look at our exposure to private equity funds of funds, uh, those funds have added a thousand basis points of extra of value above and beyond their fees in comparison to the public market equivalent benchmarks. We believe that warrants paying fees. That's net of all fees paid. So yes, we are invested in private equity. We are invested in private real estate. Uh, we stay away from funds that are levered. We stay away from funds where we believe the bets are outsized. We stay away from funds where it's difficult to value the holdings. Uh, while the holdings in private equity funds are illiquid, they are valued. We do get audited statements from them. And importantly, we understand uh, the cash flows that come out of those funds as those companies are sold and values re realized. Thank you, Eric, for that. Rob LeClaire. Um, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Eric. Thank you for being here. Um, can you tell me the changes to the funds that you had recommended? Who did you make the recommendations to and who ultimately made the decision to make the changes? We made the recommendations to the Vermont Pension Investment Committee and those members voted in support of those changes, allowing us to proceed. They have the ultimate authority to approve any hiring or firing of investment managers or strategies in addition to setting policy and setting the asset allocation. And has it always been that way in your understanding? Uh, you know, I can't speak for much before my time of arrival, but certainly since the Vermont Pension Investment Committee has been formed, They've been uh, tasked with the authority to approve those manager hirings and firings. Very good. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you very much, Eric, for testifying and helping us <clears throat> uh, wend our way through uh, governance and practices. My question, and you may have already answered it uh, just previously, <clears throat> uh, you do look at, <clears throat> even if the profile or performance uh, characteristics of a particular um, uh, asset use might uh, be attractive, you uh, nevertheless weigh that attractiveness fit, if you will, um, with the attendant fees. I think that's what you uh, testified to. And I, I draw attention to that because I think, rightly or wrongly, uh, there are uh, unfounded allegations that we seem, because some of these fees are not uh, publicly disclosed, either they're proprietary or whatever, uh, that we may be in, involved in um, investment vehicles where the return to fee ratio is unacceptable. And I, I think I heard you say, we carefully weigh the value to the overall character of the fund with the fees that are attended there too. Am I, do I, did I hear you right? Absolutely correct. Fees are essential. Uh, they come directly out of the bottom line and those managers to whom we're paying fees need to be generating value above and beyond those fees. We're happy to pay fees all day long to our managers who are generating significant outperformance. Again, in the private market space, we believe we can get excess returns by seeking the liquidity premium. 
We've identified best in class partners to do so. One of our benefits in this space is that we're small relative to other states pension funds. So it can allow us to gain access to funds that are maybe a little smaller and niche or maybe a little more nimble. Um, but again, we, we, we obsess over fees. Um, they're, they're critical. That's the one thing we can control. We can't control what the, the stock market does. We can't control what interest rates do, but we can control fees and we can control our expectations for those managers. Thank you, well put. I have one follow-up, Madam Chair, and that is back to uh, a, a change which I think is in the process, namely trying to increase the um, frequency of what the committee or I will call reality checks, which is to say, try to match what actually, uh, how various aspects of the pension fund are performing compared to um, uh, predictions of how uh, we think it should perform or should have performed, sort of experience checks. Do you internally, and, th and this by the way would be done usually out of the treasurer's office or by one or VPEC, I'm, I guess I'm curious as to whether or not you internally do those kinds of, did this turn out the way we thought it was going to turn out? Uh, and what have we learned if it didn't? And how frequently do you do those kind of retrospective, uh, how are we doing in our decision-making and judgment? Thanks. Sure, we do asset allocation studies every year where we run capital market assumptions based on our target allocation and look at pot other uh, potential changes to the allocation to determine whether there might be a more efficient direction for the portfolio. We also, uh, as we are uh, managing the day-to-day -day operations, we're forecasting cash needs to meet benefit payments and capital calls so that we are sure we have sufficient liquidity on hand to do those things. Uh, I, I won't get too far into the actuarial side because the, the, the pension plans boards oversee that, but they're doing annual valuations. We look at those valuations. They do periodic experience studies. We certainly look at those periodic experience studies and we do periodic asset liability studies where we're modeling not only the investment returns of the portfolio through Monte Carlo's, but looking at their impact on pension funding and contribution levels going forward. Tanya Bihovsky. Madam Chair, I have two questions. One is about sort of the transparency and how all of this information about how these decisions are made and what the fees are and what the returns are, are made available to stakeholders and who that list of stakeholders includes. So all of our investment performance and fees are disclosed not only uh, in conjunction with the board materials on the treasurer's website, but in the uh, quarterly investment performance reports that are posted under the pension plan section of each website. We show in there uh, investment performance for numerous periods for each strategy and each manager, as well as fees paid to those strategies. Okay, so someone would have to seek that out on the treasurer's page. It's not sent to people who are invested in the pension or, or anyone, it's just posted on those pages. Correct. Okay, thank you. My other question is actually kind of, is going back to Representative Higley's question about the um, article that was posted in Vermont Digger. It also pointed to the fact that it might make sense to invest all or the vast majority in index funds. Um, and I'm wondering what percentage of our current investments are invested in index funds and how that decision was made. And I also believe Burlington recently has done that for something very similar for their municipal pensions. And I suspect Representative Cooper can weigh in more there, but I'm curious about that. Uh, I am a very big proponent of index funds. Uh, you're able to capture the market returns for essentially no fee. And we've indexed over half of our portfolio. Uh, on the active on the public active equity manager, the bar for us to hire or retain an active equity manager is extremely high. They need to show a proven ability to outperform their fee. Um, where I think we need where we venture beyond index funds and beyond public equities is in search of excess returns. That's where uh, we've gone to private markets. Not only does that add an element of diversification away from the public stock market, um, but it also um, again, allows us to capture that illiquidity premium. Uh, the concern we would have with it simply indexing the portfolio to a 70% S&P and 30% to a, a US bond index is one evaluation. Uh, the valuations of S&P 500 companies right now are very high relative to history. The valuations of bonds in the Barclays, uh, the 
Barclays Global Aggregate or the Barclays US Aggregate Bond Index are very high as well. We're in a world of zero, essentially zero interest rates and a return to normal will certainly be very painful for those holdings in the US bond exposure, could very well be painful for those holdings in the S&P 500, just given where the valuations are. So we've diversified in our index strategy uh, beyond the U.S., uh, we don't think we're smart enough to know when the U.S. will outperform non-U.S. holdings. So we've essentially adopted a global equity index, uh, the Acqui IMI, which uh, essentially has every region of the globe at its, uh, at its relative cap weight. Uh, but move, we believe it's prudent to move beyond simply a 70-30 portfolio to add elements of diversification and illiquidity to help us capture us capture the illiquidity premium. It's very easy to look back in time and say, if you had done this strategy or that strategy, you would have outperformed where you are. Much more difficult to do that in advance. Of course, thank you so much. And my last is just a follow-up around the transparency around the private equity and the real estate. Is that transparency the same as it is for public index funds? Uh, we disclose fees paid, we disclose uh, holdings, we disclose valuations, um, we do so quarterly. Great, thank you. Sam LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just was hoping to be reminded when you started at the beginning of your presentation, you said um, when you took over and started making these changes, could you just remind me how long ago that was? Two and a half years ago. Thank you. Uh, Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. A quick follow-up to Representative Lefebvre's question. What would you say on average, and I certainly am not an expert, is sort of the amount of time you need to wait to start to see the return on investment for big changes like the ones you made just a little over two years ago? Uh, I would say we've seen them relatively quickly just by virtue of eliminating the fees on the active equity products we've eliminated. We've seen them very quickly by virtue of avoiding an $80 million loss on all eons. Uh, we've seen them very quickly by moving out of hedge funds and adopting bond exposure as a downturn hedge as we went into the downturn last March. Uh, these other, you know, other changes take much longer, much longer to see. When, when you're committing to a private equity fund, uh, you, you won't know the outcome of that for 10 or 15 years. Uh, so some of these take a very long time and some you can see relatively quickly. So, and I recognize that your crystal ball is very likely not working, um, but it's possible that some of these huge issues that we're seeing could start to right themselves as the investment changes start to, we start to see the impacts of some of these investment changes. Not that I'm saying it's gonna fix the whole problem, but the problem may shrink and change based on how the market changes given the changes we've made in investments. We certainly hope that's the case. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eric, that was a, a nicely caveated answer. <laughs> um, two things. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, I think, around what unfunded liability is, what the obligation is to it, and how it gets compensated for. Uh, I, I think explanations in the past have been somewhat confusing. Maybe you could add your perspective to it, and, and we'll go from there. So I, I, I will say that when we design the investment portfolio, we're doing so with an eye to funding those pension liabilities with an understanding of the cash flows of those plans and doing our best to maximize returns, again, within acceptable levels of risk and liquidity. Theoretically, as you add illiquid assets, you increase expected returns for that portfolio and, and you, you should increase realized returns over the long run. Uh, the challenge we face in doing so for these three pension plans is that they all three have dramatically different cash flow profiles and different funded statuses. In the teacher plan, for example, we're, we're redeeming about $13 million a month to meet those payroll obligations. In the municipal plan, uh, incoming contributions more than cover the outgoing payroll, so we're not forced to redeem anything in the municipal plan. Arguably, the municipal plan is a higher tolerance for illiquid assets than does the teacher's plan, though to date we've uh, managed this as one portfolio with one set of allocate one standard allocation for all three plans. The chairman and I have had a number of discussions about moving in the direction of separate allocations for each plan 
and we may uh, well and we, we may well proceed that direction in the future. Uh, though the past two and a half years again has been focused more on fundamentals, streamlining the portfolio, uh, gaining an understanding of each product and its role, and rationalizing fees. So it's good that you brought that up. VPIC used to have separate silos for each plan when we came in, and we abandoned that in favor of cost savings, basically. So it's we've been talking about it for a long time. It's good to hear that uh, everybody is looking to move in that direction. Are you, uh, because I know you monitor what's happening with the plan daily, uh, expecting a turnaround in the return of this particular year that will be significant earnings? Um, so in terms of reinvestment returns for this current fiscal year? Yeah. Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, if you look at the returns year to date, they're very strong. And uh, you know, I had a discussion with, with a person um, you know, over a few months ago. You know, the question was, well, when will you know, when we have a good idea what the fiscal year's return will be? And the answer is after the fiscal year has concluded, because we just don't know what's going to happen. You know, we've seen these dislocations like Brexit and ta taper, ta taper tantrum and other things that tend to happen in mid-June. And we just don't know until the fiscal year has ended. But certainly to date, performance has been strong. Uh, we hope it continues and markets retain their, their valuations. And we hope that earnings on the companies in which we're invested continue to increase to justify the level of valuation. Uh, but we just don't know until the, the period has ended. And last question, Madam Chair. Based upon the lowering of the assumed rate of return, the uh, probably the wrong word, but the compounding effect of stronger returns will be effectively have impact on the state's contribution and the unfunded liability to some degree? To the extent our actual returns exceed the assumed rate of return, uh, those excesses come into the plan funding calculations as an experience gain. Uh, those gains are smoothed over, I believe, a five-year period, so that over time, when you have years that are above seven and below seven, uh, you're not moving the contribution rate around erratically, but rather trying to smooth out changes in that rate over the long run. Thank you. Doing a hell of a job. <laughs> So I want to just ask you to come back for a moment to something that Rep. Hooper just asked you about um, with respect to the, uh, the relative um, health of each of the different pension systems. Um, if I am a teacher, uh, the health of my system is in a very different place than if I am a municipal manager and uh, and you are you talked about the fact that your your investment strategy is looking um, across the whole system um, but what should I be worried about if I'm a teacher and what is the threat to my retirement system based on the fact that that the teacher system is only 50 percent funded right now so I want to be careful not to get into pension policy. We have pension boards that set policy and the pension folks that own those pension boards and, and that oversee those pensions are pension experts, just like we on the pension investment committee are able to focus solely on the investment program. Uh, as we think about funding those pension plans, again, our goal is to maximize returns within acceptable levels of risk and liquidity. We're doing so to assure that we can meet the obligations uh, to pay those, not only those teachers, but also state employees and municipal employees. Uh, from our view, we don't see the investment program posing any sort of threat to any of the plans. Instead, we see it as an effective tool in funding those pension liabilities over the long term. Uh, that pension funding calculation also includes contributions from the state and contributions from the employees. Again, those, those two issues are, are beyond our area of expertise. Our role is to manage the pension fund assets. We believe we've designed a portfolio that will do so prudently over time. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna go where I think you were going, stay out of policy, but I have to return to a, a comment you made, uh, Eric, when you did distinguish <clears throat> the uh, I think you put it you put it in terms of cash flow of the teachers uh, situation versus the state employees, and I guess um, 
you intimated, and I want you to confirm this if it's true, that uh, on a cash flow basis, you actually had to, to um, um, what would you say, abandon some assets in order to meet the uh, monthly payout obligation, maybe not systematically, maybe only occasionally. And it's that fact that say, says to me, um, without cross subsidies, uh, that is uh, between groups, which I'm against, uh, it means that we really have to do something uh, on the teacher side that we might not have to do on the state employee side to make sure we're not eating assets uh, to, to uh, satisfy monthly payments. Or am I reading you wrong? I will, I will say from an investment standpoint, we've not abandoned any strategies in the teacher plan. Again, all three plans are subject to the same strategies and we're convinced that uh, the all three plans have sufficient liquidity on hand to enable us to pursue those strategies. Uh, if and when we decide to move beyond our current targets to illiquid assets, uh, there could come a point where there are different tolerances for illiquidity in those plans. We're not at that point. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, 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 the soundness of those plans, uh, there, there is an actuary that does valuations and the, the assumed rate of return serves a very important role in calculating the required contributions to those plans to keep them sound. Again, that's, that's something that's handled by the actuaries and, and the, the pension boards. Thank you, Eric. Um, so next, I think I'd like to go to Jim Voitko and want to say thank you for being with us this morning. And just to orient folks who are following along at home, um, you, uh, I would love for you to just describe uh, how you fit into uh, this conversation and, um, and maybe help us understand the, the sort of broad perspective that you have on how pensions around the country are uh, governed. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I, uh, I offer anything I say today with uh, a certain amount of humility. After 40 years of institutional investing, uh, you, one has to carry away a certain level of humility. Uh, so uh, just by way of background, as uh, Tom said, um, we, my firm, RVK, was recently retained by VPIC. Uh, to be their general consultant uh, and their advisor on investments. And as, uh, as he described and Eric described, we work as an extension of staff, but we report to the committee itself. Um, uh, there's no, no question about our reporting lines. We have a, de a defined scope of work uh, that covers some of the things that were mentioned here today by Eric, for example, asset allocation, uh, asset liability work, um, uh, manager evaluation, performance reporting, um, and many other tasks that the general consultant does. We have a team. It's actually quite a large team. Uh, consists of at least four consultants. Uh, I'm the I'm the most senior one, but uh, but it is led by two other consultants. Um, and we uh, have been hard at work uh, since last fall uh, with uh, with Eric and Tom and the committee. Uh, doing exactly what Eric described, which is uh, evaluating uh, opportunities for investment, uh, doing uh, fee analysis uh, so that VPIC can uh, get the exposures that they think are appropriate for the portfolio, but at the lowest cost possible. My firm uh, is a uh, nationally ranked uh, general consultant. Uh, pensions and investments rank us at number four, whatever that means. We don't, it's not important to us. Uh, but we do have uh, quite a few public funds, many of them state level uh, across the country, both in the east side of the, of the uh, country and the west. Uh, New York State, for example, the Common Retirement Fund is a longtime client of our firm. Uh, but we also work in Oklahoma, we work in Wyoming, uh, we work in California. Uh, so we get to see quite a few public fund governance structures um, and investment portfolios. Plus we also uh, do uh, twice each year, a review of about 90 different public funds looking at their asset allocation, um, their use of active versus index products, uh, their actuarial rate of return and, and many other statistics that we've kept track of for more than two decades. Uh, myself personally, um, I grew up on Wall Street. 
Um, I served in the federal government for a period of time uh, as a technical analyst in energy and, uh, and other uh, uh, regulatory industries. Um, spent 20 years on Wall Street, was a chief investment officer for uh, an asset management company uh, uh, with about $50 billion. Then became an executive director of the statewide Oregon pension system in which every public employee at all levels belongs to the same plan. Uh, I, uh, I had a seat on the Oregon Investment Committee, which is similar to VPIC in structure. It oversees all of the state's investment um, uh, uh, funds, uh, including uh, workers' compensation, but also the $45 billion pension plan and a number of other plans as well. And I served as the executive director uh, operating that plan as well, They're essentially the, the CEO. For the last 16 years, I've been a senior consultant and president uh, of RBK. So um, I just wanted to let people know that if I say something, it's probably because I've run into it sometime over the last uh, 40 years. Um, the, I, I guess uh, there are so many things I could say uh, about what you've said already, um, but one of the things I guess I, I would say is that everything that I have experienced in institutional investing and in governance structures, the decision-making that goes into investing uh, is a set of trade-offs. And I think that's the challenge for, for this committee and for the legislature as a whole. And some of those trade-offs are things like, you want enough views at the table in an institution like VPIC um, uh, to have some diversity uh, of views uh, and multiple eyes on possible uh, investment decision-making, but it can't be so large that uh, decision-making efficiency goes to heck in a handbasket, if you will. And we've seen boards as large as 18, 19, 20 individuals, uh, and there clearly is a, uh, a, uh, um, a potential efficiency loss when there are so many uh, voices at the table. Um, but on the other hand, uh, as I said, uh, you need, uh, or it's, it's valuable to have a number of sets of voices even in those few states that have single fiduciaries, New York and Michigan come to mind, um, they use uh, advisory committees to advise the single fiduciary and those, and we have worked with both of those, as I've mentioned, um, and these are real advisory committees. So, so that's one trade-off. Another trade-off um, that, um, uh, that you have to grasp is that uh, there are two tasks in uh, running a public pension system. There's a, a big category of what we would call administrative tasks. That is getting pension benefits paid, uh, keeping careful record of benefits earned. Um, and then there's investment tasks. States have um, uh, varied widely as to how they balance that trade-off. Uh, in the case of Oregon, West Virginia, um, uh, Wisconsin, uh, just to use a few examples, um, Florida is also an example. Uh, they have created structures very much like you have in Vermont with an investment uh, committee or board that focuses solely on investments. They're not distracted by disability hearings or other actuarial debates and things like that. They are focused solely on investments. There's a real advantage to that. Um, and uh, uh, Montana is a, yet another example of that. But there are also states that try to combine the two into single boards and they struggle with that. Uh, and sometimes they create subcommittees that try to focus on investments. Sometimes that's successful, but oftentimes if you sit on one of these boards that do both the administrative side and the investment side, no member of that board wants to be out of the investment decision-making process. So oftentimes, as in the case of CalPERS, they have an investment committee, but guess what? It's the committee of the whole. So, um, so that's a challenge, uh, that's a trade-off. Another one is membership, which I know that uh, the composition of the board, which I know is one of the things that you're interested in. And the trade-off there is representation versus independence. Um, uh, there's uh, probably the largest number of seats in public pension boards are driven by representation. Uh, they represent the retirees, they represent the active employees, they represent the employers. Sometimes even they represent economic sectors of the, uh, uh, of the state. Uh, that's, that's true in uh, uh, at least one state I'm aware of. Um, 
versus independents where the, the uh, individuals charged with making investment decisions really have no ties to any particular constituency. Uh, that balance uh, is a difficult one to strike and it's above my pay grade. Um, I will say that uh, there have been some academic studies that suggest that, uh, uh, and not many of them, but there have been some that suggest that if the, in, uh, the uh, balance is struck more toward representation than independence in investment decision-making, that can be a problem. Um, so uh, uh, I'll move to the next set of trade-offs, which is representation versus expertise. Independence and expertise are not necessarily the same thing. Both are valuable. Um, and uh, uh, you know, you, I know that that's also an issue that you are wrestling with and it's very difficult because financial expertise uh, is difficult to define when it comes to the very specific tasks necessary to run a multi-asset class portfolio for a public pension plan, plan like uh, the plans that in Vermont. Uh, there are many financial uh, uh, professionals who do a great job at what they do, but what they do is not terribly applicable to running an institutional fund. And so that's the challenge that somebody uh, uh, in um, a legislative body like yourself would, uh, would face is how do we define something that's, uh, that's so uh, where the tasks that are necessary are, uh, are not ubiquitous across all of the financial expertise professions um, in, the, uh, uh, in the broad and, and sprawling financial um, uh, services industry. With respect to transparency, which was uh, one of the questions that was raised, we would say that most states have decided there is, there is no material trade-off. Transparency is a good thing, pure and simple. The, the sole exceptions are uh, that are written into statute in other states relate to things that would harm the fund itself and therefore the beneficiaries. Things like the boards are allowed to uh, discuss in private litigation, uh, not uncommon, or they're allowed to address pending decisions that could uh, adversely affect investments like uh, um, the sale of particular securities or real estate where the knowledge of that they were considering that might affect the value of them and therefore adversely affect um, the participants. Um, so, uh, so I think these trade-offs are very, are very important if you're thinking about um, uh, structural changes in governance and the decision-making process. Uh, I will say one thing that I have been asked uh, by the treasurer uh, and by the chair of VPIC to discuss, and that is, um, how does one assess risk in the portfolio? And my recommendation has been that there are very standard best practices to pursue in assessing the health and risks to uh, the asset base for a pension plan, but also the combined effect of the um, uh, contribution policy, the benefit policy, and the investments. Um, and so, uh, I have uh, offered up some thoughts to that, to, to that effect in terms of asset allocation using what we call stochastic, that's a, a geek term that we, uh, that we statisticians use that basically ask the question, okay, this is what we expect to happen. How big is the distribution of possible outcomes, either worse or better that we might expect? And the other is asset liability, which our firm and, and me personally are very, very um, uh, supportive of. We are uh, a tremendous supporters of asset liability work. One of the challenges that your structure has is that you have the benefit of having VPIC focused solely on investments and you have your administrative boards focused very tightly on the administration of the pension plans. But there is one element that has to be done periodically and that is, look at the plans holistically, the contribution policy, the benefit policy, and the investments, not, not individually, but together. And the way that you can get the benefits of the structure that, that you have in Vermont is by mandating periodic asset liability studies. It is the gold standard for assessing the current health of a pension plan in all dimensions, 
as well as its likely future path, as well as the distribution of possible future paths that it might take. And uh, we've done something on the order of 50 to 60 of these just in recent years because uh, pension plan, public pension plans, but also some corporate ones and some, uh, and some uh, special, uh, special purpose funds uh, are all uh, struggling to essentially get a handle on how they meet the obligations that are created uh, in, the, in the benefit policy uh, and understanding what the effect of the contribution policy is. And now I'll say something that might, I, I don't mean it to be provocative, but it, it happens to be a fact, that if you were to look at the five most underfunded state pension plans in the country, it is almost certain that what you would see that they would share is um, a, uh, a reluctance on the part of the plan sponsor to the ultimate plan sponsor to make the actuarially required contribution. Um, whether it's Kentucky, Illinois, New, New, New Jersey, you can go on down the list. That is the common factor because no matter how terrific your investment strategy is, no matter how great VPIC is at executing it, no matter how great uh, Eric is in terms of balancing that uh, return seeking versus prudent risk, prudent levels of risk, if there are insufficient contributions, there's nothing to invest. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's fundamental, and that is, is, contribution policy is fundamental, it is turning out, and a bigger driver of unfunded liabilities across public pension plans in the United States than perhaps any other factor. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's a, a, a summary of, uh, of uh, sort of the, the points that I wanted to bring to your attention today. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. I'm happy to make a few short comments about the topics that have been brought up uh, so far today. Uh, whatever you like, Madam Chair. I have a couple hands up and then, uh, and then we can go back to any comments that you might have to previous questions. Um, Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for being here to, to help us wrap our heads around governance. My question is when the last time that kind of holistic study or audit of everything and how it works together was done for the Vermont systems? That's a question I don't know the answer to, and maybe Eric or Tom knows. We have not been asked to do one yet. They are very extensive studies and they take as long as three or four months uh, to execute, but they are, they're, they offer, in my opinion, unbelievable insight into the health of a pension plan. I'll, I'll stop they, there, Tom, Eric. Jim, that is a study we've been asking, and I've been asking Eric to perform. I know Eric will joke that I, I say, well, it's crazy, and, and it's a figuring out what it actually goes, oh, Tom, you're just retail uh, investor, but I really think understanding the liabilities is essential, and I've been asking for these type of questions for the past number of years and getting the way to do it and the correct interaction between the actuaries and the consultant has been the difficult part. And that's one of the exciting features I find with RVK and one of the reasons we went with them. Okay, so a quick follow up to that. Does that mean that study is upcoming so we can have a true sense of the health or is it still in process? Where, where are we at in that process? Cause I want that information. Well, we had one, I think in 2019, Eric, I don't know if you remember the first liability study we did, which was more of an initial stab at it with uh, Siegel. Um, we can get you that copy from the one we've already done uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the process with RVK is to be determined, so we don't have that just yet. But that will be, that'll be as, as soon as practical. Great. And, and representative, I will say that best practice is uh, in order to make the study credible, uh, two things have to happen. One is, is that we should, we RVK should be using the freshest actuarial data possible. So we'd like to schedule it right after the completion of a, uh, of a actuarial valuation. And the second thing is a, a high level of cooperation between ourselves and your actuary, because credibility means when we bring the study forward, we have to say it, it reflects precisely what you've heard from your actuary, but then goes beyond that. Um, and as I said, creates this holistic view, but these are not trivial studies. These are, these take as long as four months to execute because they cover all aspects of the pension plan. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. 
that is helpful for me to understand. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jim, I got a, a couple of questions and I'm not sure if the second one, if you're you're the right person for it, but um, I think you touched upon it, but can you it, touch upon when you have um, a person who's a member of the pension, uh, how their perspective helps on the investment side of things? And then the second question I have is, we've heard a few times that the, um, the Great Recession back in 07 and 09 has affected, obviously, the plan's performance. Um, are you able to speak to how it's affected us to, to where we are in today's times and dollars? Um, let me take the, the first one. And that is, is that, um, I don't think that there's any generic answer to how a representative person, say a retiree, uh, typically contributes to investment decision-making. Um, my sense is, and it's just a sense, that representative positions are, are often created um, to essentially ensure that stakeholders have a direct view, and some say, into pension decision-making, whether it's pension administration, disability policy, actuarial policy, or, or investments. Um, and I have experienced personally, and our firm has, uh, rep board members who are essentially are filling representative positions who have been excellent contributors uh, to investment decision-making, um, and some that, uh, uh, that were, uh, shall we say, working hard to figure out the investment side of the world, even though they may understand the liability side, the benefit policies very, very well, which you would expect because that's, that's the world that they come from. Um, so I don't have a, a clear answer there. Um, and with respect to where we are in dollars, uh, I don't know the, I don't have that at the, at the tip of my tongue. I agree with Eric so far. Uh, this uh, turnaround in performance has been somewhat sustained uh, and the portfolio is in increasingly better shape as the VPIC committee and Eric and his staff continue to work to refine it. Um, we have been, we have, we, since we've been brought on board and back in November, I can't tell you how many interactions we've had. It's been unbelievable though. The, the flow back and forth between ourselves, between the board, and certainly with the staff. But I will say this about performance. Pension investing uh, it benefits from consistent application of a thought out strategy over a very long period of time. I know that the long, long time period is sometimes uh, seen as an excuse, but I will tell you that in 40 years, the kind of short-term bets, somebody mentioned uh, the hedge fund uh, family office that blew up, uh, the, 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 the big performance blow-ups, Orange County years ago, uh, as an example, uh, have been driven by uh, investment strategies that have tried to be overly opportunistic and not structurally sound and, and move through time with some measure of consistency. And what that means is, is that there are going to be years in which uh, so far uh, you exceed your expectations, the expectations that are built into your contribution policy. Here's that link again, contribution policy, you know, benefits. Um, and, uh, and, and so, but there are going to be years in which it falls short. The capital markets can't be commanded to give you returns. You have to structure your, it's like creating a fishing net that you move through the capital markets ocean and you hope to catch as many fish as you possibly can. And that's exactly what Eric and his team and VPIC are trying to do. They're trying to create a diversified portfolio that may not be the best performer in any given year, but over 10 or 15 years catches a lot of fish. I, I, I'm prone to using metaphors, I apologize for that. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as a metaphor user, Jim, that was a great metaphor. Um, I, my question is sort of simple, I think. Um, 
before you applied for the contract, I'm sure that you basically said, what are we getting ourselves into? And <laughs> you've had some experience with now being in it. So in your preparation to engage in a bid and since you've been employed, have you found a structure in place at VPIC to be functional and effective? Um, you know, I, the representatives on the committee may find this, uh, that I'm an interested party because obviously I work for VPIC, but I will tell you point blank that the, every, every aspect of the decision-making process that we have had the opportunity to observe, which I think is everything uh, since we were brought on board has been best practice. Um, I can't think of a single, a single deviation uh, from best practice. And the conversations and discussion have been reflective of that um, trade-off that I talked earlier about having a, a diverse set of views, but not so many people at the table that the conversation breaks down. I think we've all been at dinner parties where there's so many people around a big table that the, you can't have one conversation. That can't happen in a, an investment community. There has to be one conversation. So um, take it for what it's worth. Um, I'm, I'm too old and too battle scarred to blow smoke at people. Uh, I have not, nor has my team uh, seen anything in the decision-making process that is other than best practice uh, to date in our engagement. I'll stop there. And as a follow-up, every, some conversation about where you come from having bearing, um, everyone that sits at the table is first obligated to their fiduciary obligation. Uh, which I know you would teach. And reflective of the position that the committee is taking, that has an influence upon what you bring forward in recommendations for products and participation in markets, I would assume. Um, there is no question. When you, when, when you collect billions of dollars in a single place, it attracts attention. Uh, I, I've run a pension plan. I've seen that attention firsthand. And uh, I'm not an attorney. I'm certainly not in a fiduciary attorney. So uh, I want to be very careful and humble here. But I've heard many, many conversations and instructions and advice given by fiduciary counsel to uh, the clients that we serve. And the, the phrase for the sole benefit of the beneficiaries, for the sole benefit of the participants, um, is one that is repeated over and over and over again. And yet there are so many temptations to use those billions of dollars for other things. Um, policies like that are above our pay grade. We try to help our clients achieve their goals, um, but their goals uh, you know, are partly driven by fiduciary law, statutes, um, and their sense of fiduciary duty. So I'll stop there, Representative Hooper. I, think, I hope that was... Uh, I hope that was responsive. I, I appreciate that answer. And I'll ask you now one tongue in the cheek question. Um, oh. Aside from uh, that guy out in Nebraska or wherever he is, is anybody always right in this environment? Well, I think I know who you're referring to. And by the way, he's not always right. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's made some brilliant decisions and he's also had, he's also had some uh, investments go south uh, on him as well. But again, I would go back to uh, the comment that I made about uh, c continuity of approach. Uh, Warren Buffett, had, if nothing else, suffers from a huge amount, benefits from a huge amount of continuity of approach. If you read his investment letters over the years, you'll see the same um, principles of investing that he follows echoed over and over again, whether he's had a good year or a bad year. Uh, you know, investing uh, billions of dollars looks easy to anyone who hasn't had the uh, responsibility of doing it. It is not easy, I can tell you that. And, and um, it's also a, a public pension plan, a DB pension plan and a portfolio move like an aircraft carrier. You spin the wheel and eventually it turns because just the sheer weight of the vessel and the fact that liabilities don't change all that much over time uh, and that the capital markets uh, don't respond to, uh, to your changes in your portfolio like that. In some respects, VPIC 
uh, has had an unusually productive couple of years under uh, Tom and Eric's leadership, simply because the changes they've made have been pretty much in sync with what's been happening in the market and continue to be so, uh, to their credit. But, um, but the, I gave a speech once uh, to a, a group of legislators, um, and in fact, I was asked to give it several times, in which I said to legislators, and I hope you won't take this the wrong way that I'm preaching to you, but your life is, is so much wrapped around your annual or biannual budgets. Uh, and the budgeting exercise is completely foreign to the financial dynamics. The annual budgeting exercise is completely foreign to the financial dynamics of a public pension plan, particularly a perpetual one that presumably may go on for 100 years. And getting your arms around that is very difficult. When I was an executive director, I had to, to uh, appear before many, many business groups and they have a different paradigm in their mind. Their paradigm, of course, is the annual profit and loss statement and the balance sheet. And those are somewhat useful to a public pension plan, but again, foreign to the, to the financial dynamics of a public defined benefit pension plan, which move slower and are uh, particularly given the decisions in most states by the Supreme Courts in those states that these are contract uh, obligations um, are, are, uh, are completely different than what most businesses deal with, the world they live in, and quite frankly, what most of the, of the financial decisions that legislators have to deal with in dealing with their periodic budget decisions. You, one of the members asked the question, for example, what is the threat to teachers um, because the plan is underfunded and more so than your other plans? Um, it, it, I can't give you uh, legal advice, I don't know, um, and I'm not qualified, but in states where uh, this, their Supreme Court, their constitution or their statutes have been uh, co conceived as committing a promise of benefits, then the, the pool of assets becomes merely a tool in executing that promise. If the, if the fund were to disappear tomorrow, the promise and the obligation would still exist. So I have always said to retirees when I ran a program that uh, myself is that uh, if the courts in our state when I was the executive director felt that way and they did, um, they've got little to worry about. Um, you know, uh, the state has an obligation to them. One might argue that for active employees, there's always the threat that legislative bodies may, uh, if the if the uh, uh, statute or constitution of that state allows it, might change benefits and create new tiers that would adversely affect their futures. Again, above my pay grade, but it's happened in many states. So I'm not saying that there's, there's uh, no risk to, to active employees. Uh, there may be some, um, but th that's the framework in which I've observed in states across the United States. So I'll stop there, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to uh, go back um, a little bit to your discussion of the in-depth um, risk and liability kind of deep dive and point out, um, I'm sorry this will sound sort of boring to my colleagues on the committee, uh, deep dive into the state employee side because at the present time it's an aggregate about five different uh, profiles, if you will, of, uh, of benefit packages and contribution rates and all the things you ticked off. And I guess what I want to um, bring to your attention is for us to be uh, surgical or skillful at trying to make adjustments, we would need what you just described on a disaggregated basis for those groups. Otherwise, we will invariably be continuing what I think or suspect may be some cross subsidy, some inequities, uh, the payout to or, or, or contribution to benefit ratios are all over the place. So let me just stop there. That, that would be terrifically helpful as we move forward. The other subject that you raised goes back to what kind of people and what kind of relationship to VPEC would be 
desirable. And you talked about independence and expertise and, um, and size, of course. Uh, and, and we have a, a working proposal that wants to expand the number of people beyond the current number. Um, maybe more, more than maybe more than two, maybe less, maybe the same. Um, and I guess what I want to know, because uh, the key connection to the political environment in the current regime is the treasurer. The treasurer in our state, like many states, is elected. So how does the notion of independence play? in the context of having a, not only a supporting staff connected to a politically elected um, person, our treasurer, um, but also that person chairing a board and having a vote. In light of your discussion about um, independence, no one's questioning treasurer's expertise. Um, it's really a question of independence from whatever winds of change are. Um, so let me shut up there for a moment and I have a follow-up, but. Wow, uh, well, you, you asked two big questions. Um, let me deal with the elected officials sitting on the investment board first. <clears throat> I can tell you that uh, this is a, a special example of what I would call uh, the representative seat. Um, an elected official obviously couldn't get elected and uh, without uh, being able to claim that they represent a majority of the voters of the state. I mean, that's, that's a given. And so they're standing as, uh, 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 as claiming, as, as being eligible for a representative seat on an investment board is unquestioned, it's unquestioned. On the other hand, um, states have addressed this question of the trade-off between the natural turnover that happens in elected officials, member continuity is one of the important things, as well as the fact that elected officials are also um, typically members of the uh, pension plan itself. So they have several different representative hats in different ways. Uh, on one end, we have um, Michigan and uh, New York where the elected treasurer and comptroller respectively are the sole fiduciaries and make all final decisions. So that's one extreme. On the other extreme, we have situations where the, the treasurer or the CFO of the state might be given a seat on the investment board, um, but typically it's not the chair. Uh, and uh, New Mexico is an example of that, for, for instance, uh, as, is, um, as is Pennsylvania. Um, and so uh, uh, Oregon is an example as well. So uh, no, no state has staked out sort of a, the most common or best way. I don't know what the best way is to judge this trade-off between the unquestioned claim of being a, a representative of the statewide taxpayer population versus uh, the question of how much independence that do, uh, do you desire. Um, that's, a, that's a decision well above my pay grade. I will just say that, that states have decided this in multiple ways. Um, and I'm uh, knowing a little bit about Vermont, I suspect that you will find your own way, the Vermont way. <laughs> um, now, if I could, if, if you don't mind, I, I, I would like to deal with the question uh, that you raised about an investment committee that has multiple underlying fan, uh, plans. We call that the board of investment structure. And as I said earlier, it has the great advantage of putting all investment decisions with a single group of people that focus on nothing but investment decisions. And I'm, as I mentioned, Montana has that example, uh, Wisconsin has that example, West Virginia, Florida, uh, you know, there are quite a number. And uh, uh, even though it's not the most common uh, uh, structure uh, across the country, um, the, um, but, uh, and I understand the worry about cross subsidization but I think that that's a very small risk. Uh, and partly it's because cross subsidization can only occur really on the administrative side when money is moved from the credit of one plan to the credit of another plan. And an investment board typically doesn't do that. 
uh, that's handled by the, the uh, boards that administer the plan. They are the record keepers for who's, what portion of the assets that the investment committee is managing um, uh, belong to this plan or that plan or this tier or that tier uh, in some cases when uh, individual participants have some kind of right that's, uh, that's asset tied. Uh, an example might be a hybrid plan where it's part DB, part DC. However, one of the challenges and Tom's comments earlier referred to this that, uh, that are faced by multiple underlying entities is whether or not, uh, and it's an investment challenge, not a cross subsidization challenge, it's an investment challenge that do, do we as is, as is currently done uh, in Vermont, try to construct an asset um, a strategy with liquidity, uh, uh, liquidity considerations as, as Eric mentioned that fit the sum of the liability streams and liquidity demands of the underlying clients. Uh, and it's done that way in some states. Um, but on the other hand, if the, if the requirements of the underlying funds are wildly different, uh, then the question becomes, should we really be thinking about different asset allocations for different plans? So I'll, I'll give you an example. We, uh, we had a client once that had a general, uh, a general um, uh, employees plan that was about 70% funded. And they had a judge's plan that was 124%. I'm, I'm recalling these figures from memory, so please don't hold me to them. And those were quite different. And why was the judge's plan so overfunded? It wasn't because they were subjected to or benefited from different investment decisions. They did not. It was because they had a different funding mechanism, a different contribution mechanism. It was funded off of court fees, and court fees were such that they exceeded uh, the uh, essentially what the actuary would call the actuarially required rate. And so we had some pretty disparate; uh, 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 those were those were pretty disparate situations. And so we recommended consideration of perhaps um, a a separate uh, approach to the judge's plan because it makes no sense to wildly overfund a plan, particularly one that was fed by fees that were not subject to being raised or lowered as contribution rates are for most public pension plans. Um, but in order to do that, in order to do that, one has to not only consider uh, different asset allocations, but one has to structure the investment portfolio to allow what we call unitized approach. And a unitized approach is, I don't take this the wrong way, but it's kind of like turning it into a mutual fund in which each of the participating underlying employers own units in the fund, but they own units in different parts of the fund. So a very overfunded plan where you say, we don't need to take risk. They might own more of the fixed income units and less of the equity units, the risk oriented units. With another plan that really needed um, uh, a sustained 10, 20, 30 year effort to, uh, to uh, acquire returns, um, they might own more of the risk assets going forward and fewer of the, uh, of the conservative ones because they can't, because conservative ones in excess would drive up the uh, contribution rates uh, if followed that way. So I know, I, I know I've gotten mighty technical, but I did want to say that uh, cross subsidization is probably a very, very small risk, but the the challenge to be pick in uh, in this in, in serving underlying funds uh, is is real, um, but it's not always it's not always the case that you should treat your underlying entities differently. Montana doesn't, for example, um, but there are situations where uh, this unitized structure is used in order to differentiate the underlying clients. So I know I've probably gotten way too deep in the weeds and I apologize, sir, but um, I hope that was helpful. It was, thank you very much. I did worry about disparate contribution rates uh, and benefit payouts. Maybe I shouldn't, but that's, I, 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 uh, I latched onto that rightly or wrongly. Uh, one other, um, uh, if you will, question uh, that I'd like you to expound on, you have repeatedly emphasize continuity both on the investment strategy side 
and also participation in the investment oversight body, however big or however constituted. Um, consequently, it probably is not, and I'd like you to comment on this, it's probably not a good idea to essentially say, um, so-and-so uh, has a seat on the board and can appoint someone to serve in his or her stead. Uh, I, I'm wor I worry about the collision of, gee, I, I, uh, I don't wanna go and do this this month or next month or this year. And all of a sudden continuity is out the window because I can't find anybody to consistently pay attention to this. And so it seems to me what you want is independence, but you also want like a multi-year commitment you want to go beyond the learning curve, and you obviously want to, um, as you've already explained, avoid any potential conflicts because of either pecuniary or employment, uh, uh, if you will, uh, interference with your fiduciary uh, responsibilities. Am I, am I sort of reading that correctly? You are. Um, let me just say, uh, again, it's just a, a, an opinion based on experience that Nothing undermines the credibility and trust in a public state public pension plan than, um, than pay to play, corruption, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, those are things that every citizen pretty much understands quite well. And I have seen examples of this in several different states and how problematic it can be. Uh, so there's that. With respect to stand-ins or um, uh, I have seen both kinds of situations. In the case of Pennsylvania, when we worked with them some years ago, the uh, state treasurer and the, I think it's the state treasurer and maybe the several legislators that had seats on the board were allowed to uh, nominate a substitute if they were unavailable, who could cast vote uh, in there and ask questions and participate in the discussion in lieu of their uh, attendance. So that's one extreme. Um, and uh, on the other extreme, when I sat on the, uh, the essentially the VPIC clone, of the investment committee of Oregon, uh, the governor insisted that there would be an attendance requirement. And if you uh, failed to attend at a, at, at a given rate, um, he would remove you as a matter of policy. And that actually did happen, if I recall correctly. Uh, so, um, so again, there's uh, no one state has followed precisely the same path, but there's two extreme examples uh, of um, of states that have addressed this issue of stand-ins and commitment at least to attend. So I'll stop there, sir. I hope that was responsive. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, several committee members who have uh, standing meetings at noon. And so I think we are going to uh, call that a wrap for this morning. And I wanna thank you, Jim and Eric and Tom for being with us. Um, we are rescheduling Mr. Briggs for this afternoon since we didn't get a chance to get to his, uh, his thoughts this morning. Um, but thank you so much for coming and sharing your uh, perspectives with us so that we and others who are following this discussion can understand more about how the investment decisions are made um, for this public pension system. Uh, very informative. Thank you all. And